Anders pulled us down into the hardcore world of type systems and checking, and we're going to stay there in this uh, double session. First with uh, Aaron from Indiana University, and not the University of Indiana, as I have sometimes uh, erroneously referred to it. I think we've been working with Aaron for nearly three years now on, uh, on the, the compiler that he's going to talk about, but also on the design of futures and isolates. So the early discussions we had with him influenced the, uh, the design of those features that are now in, in APL. And after that, we'll have a slightly more lightweight compiler talk from, uh, from Nick about a compiler that's actually in Dialog version 14. Yeah. Aaron. Thank you. And um, yeah, so I'm Aaron from Indiana University. And I guess I've lost track of how long I've been working with APL. It's not very long, but long enough that I have to think about it. Um, my first comment is, in academia, conferences are where it's at, not user meetings. So <laughs> I'm just going to put my academic quotes around conference here, and uh, we'll, we'll go with that. And also, I'm super excited about the, the talks that I see, have seen so far and that I, I think are coming up, because I, I think m the APL community needs to do more of this work, and I, I really like to see so many interesting approaches to these solutions. So we're going to do a little bit of a, a, a trinity of code defunds, if you will. And I've structured this talk, hopefully, to be extremely flexible, which it may just mean that I run out of things to say. Um, but feel free to interrupt if you feel like you have a, a major interesting thing to point out. I'm, I'm flexible like that. But first, since I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Code Funds project. I'll, I'll try to answer the question of why I'm even attempting something like this. Because the APL interpreter is pretty stinking fast. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities that compilers can give you. But if I'm thinking of really the reasons I'm interested in this, one of them is I, I feel like Code Funds is a move forward in terms of how we leverage APL as a tool of thought. And I want to foster more academic research in the APL community and spread that research out into the broader computer science community as well. So Code Funds has an explicit goal of reaching into the academic and high performance computing markets, if you will. Um, I always like power, you know. Uh, and, and getting a compiler to produce really, really super fast code in modern architectures that really haven't mapped well to the traditional way th people thought about interpreters, re it really opens a door for, for a compiler to try to leverage that. And that really means massive parallelism. But if I'm really thinking about my own personal limits, I came into LPL because it was fascinating to me. And I have a tendency to take things a little bit to the extreme, sometimes. <laughs> so, hey now. Um, I really just thought, what happens if I try to push APL to the power limit as far as I can possibly get it to go? What if I just go absolutely nuts with APL? And Code Funds is sort of how that practice is evolving. So Code Funds, just to, uh, as, a, as a sort of overview, Code Funds is an external compiler that generates its own code for a given namespace script. And you run this compiler from inside of your dialog workspace. So it's not a separate product, but it, it is tied in with the dialog interpreter and interacts with, and it is launched from the dialog interpreter. It basically replaces your uh, quad fix um, function. And it's a, a mostly drop-in replacement for that. If you can provide it with a namespace script, it will give you back this compiled namespace that you can then use with your regular um, APL code. And it's written in APL. It's pure APL code. The compiler itself is APL. Actually, the compiler itself is strictly defunds or code defunds. And the code defunds language itself is the, de the defunds APL syntax with the par operator from isolates and futures and one extra character, which is the target. And the target is a single assignment empty vector, which is the exact same thing as an empty vector 
except that the fill argument is an empty single assignment array. So in isolates, we get futures back, and those futures are always sort of pre-contracted to receive their value from the computation that the future is doing. The single assignment array, instead, you can write into that array yourself, but you're only allowed to write to any given cell once. And attempting to read from a cell that hasn't been written will block that thread until somebody else writes into that. And I'm not going to go into much detail on that. I've, I've done that before, but the, and you can look at the previous um, talks or, or papers to see how that actually works. And it's a, a fairly standard practice. It's the most simple monotonic deterministic by construction parallel construct for synchronization that you can come up with. And I encourage anybody who's interested in seeing what you can do with this sort of technology to read Lindsay Cooper's recent dissertation on lattice-based approaches to concurrency, where she takes these structures and shows how to generalize them to achieve a, a remarkable number of different types of parallel programming idioms from this one idea of monotonically increasing data structures. So there's a lot of interesting theory behind that, and what we're what CodeFunds intends to build is take these ideas and put them into a language with a syntax that makes it easy to use concurrency as a tool of thought. Yeah. Uh, could you briefly uh, say what, I, what was it? Monotonic, non-deterministic. You uh, lost deterministic. Me. Okay. The whole the whole ah, phrase sorry, okay. you, used, you just so lost me entirely. When you when you have threads and concurrency, traditionally, it's a lot of work to try to make sure that the threads don't run into race conditions or deadlocks between themselves. Deterministic programs are ones that don't have those behaviors that you always get the same answer the same time all the time, right? Given the same inputs, more or less. I'm I'm fudging a bit. Um, Deterministic by construction means the only types of programs you can construct are ones that won't deadlock or have race conditions. But to interact between one another with those conditions is actually kind of a tricky thing. So what you actually end up doing is having certain invariants that are over these global data structures that are changed. And one approach to this is to make sure that your data structures only ever grow monotonically. So you never delete something or change something from the structure. The structure just sort of expands in what it's talking about. And this sounds, if you're a C programmer, it sounds kind of scary. However, almost all classes of deterministic parallel programming that I have seen in common practice tend to fit into this model. Uh, con process networks, um, fork joint parallelism, all of these sorts of things, isolates and futures, all fit within that model. So does that sort of, yeah. Um, it's basically the way you want to do parallel programming without the headaches and without having to become an expert in you know, type theory and how to prove that you have um, non-interference and that kind of thing. So what is the current status of the compiler? It's a, yes? Sorry, uh, yeah. sorry previous question yes. um, gave a string of words, you didn't explain monotonically. I know what monotonously means. And monotonic you means weren't that, continuously but. increasing in one direction or the other. The same as in calculus or real analysis or those sorts of things. Except we're monotonically increasing with respect to some lattice that we've defined. Which uh, we can, I can talk about that afterwards. I would mostly point you to Lindsay Cooper's work. Um, so the current status of the compiler, it's still largely a research project. I, I have a few things that we're working on. One is the Black-Scholes benchmark is sort of this micro benchmark that I'm using to, to demonstrate um, performance on very ideal scaling conditions. And you can read my paper at the Array 14 workshop for more information about the work with Fusion and some of the other things to get these performance metrics. But the Two graphs you see here are basically a benchmark on the Black-Scholes code using a, a version of the compiler earlier this year against the dialog interpreter. And the one here demonstrates that lower numbers, there's some overhead with the CodeFunds compiler, which we are still working to get out because we actually have to jump barriers back and forth out in and out of the compiler when we enter and leave the interpreter. But at larger scales, 
the Codefence compiler, this version of the Codefence compiler was able to uh, exceed the interpreter on this ideal scalar benchmark by 30, 20 to 30%. 30% if we added the fusion optimization. And 20, 22%, give or take, if we kept the fusion operation out. And that was an er a very early version of the compiler. So that's, and that's no parallelism, no multi-core, no vectorization or anything. So we're kind of competing apples to oranges because Dialog has very nice primitives. We don't have very nice primitives very bad primitives right now. Um, the recent status, we were using LLVM. I've since recanted and gone to generating C code, unfortunately, but it is what it is. We're designing a new project called Mystica. A group of hackers at Indiana with myself are working on a project to re-implement from the ground up the cryptographic stack in pure APL, partly as a benchmark for the Codefunds compiler. I also have some ideas relating to the type system and a little more which we're going to go into shortly. So that's sort of where we stand now. And of course, the obvious question, we're dealing with compilers. What about optimizations? I mean, this is, this is compilers. At the moment, I'm just working on the higher level design ideas of how to get it working. And through that, I gain some performance. And I have a list of optimizations that I want to implement. At the moment, they are not implemented, but they, I'm prototyping various optimization opportunities to decide where to take those opt op optimizations. But if I just talk about the compiler, that's no fun. So I figure we can go into a little uh, set of demos. And I have a few demos prepared. And I thought I'd do a choose your own adventure. And then I realized demos, adventure, probably not what we want. So we're going to try to have a nice, peaceful, calm, relaxed, retirement community demo type thing that works perfectly well. And we'll see if that works. So we'll go through a basic compiler. And then I've got a few other things we can talk about here. The Mystica project a little bit. I can show you some of that. And I can show you how the compiler is actually designed in the internals, which I find really, really interesting. Um, and we can get back to that at any point. And then I've got some special sauce uh, that we have to throw in there, some, some fun stuff. So just to give you a little idea of how the compiler works right now, let's go to our terminal. And so if we're inside the terminal and we pull up our system, we would load in the defunds workspace. And now we're ready to compile something. So I've prepared. Uh, since I don't want to try to do this too much, I prepared a little benchmark. And let's go here. And let's see if I can do this. Quad CR. There we go. OK. So this shows a little trivial, trivial benchmark of the Codefunds compiler. So I have this function here that generates some random data. I guess I should show you what that looks like. So we're just generating uh, a random matrix with some data. This is the, what we feed into the black shoals. We've got some integers and some floats. And this is how we call the compiler. So we take in a given program, which in this case is this little program here. It's just a simple, it's, it's an ex extract from the black shoals benchmark. We're just doing some scalar computations. And we pass that as the right argument to our fix function. And on the left, arg left argument, we give it the prefix name to a file without the extension. And that is where it's going to do its, its magic. And what it will do is create a shared object that is linked back into the dialog interpreter and then is called from that using quad NA uh, functions. So that's where we get some of our overhead in small variable sizes, because there's a lot of overhead to quad NA uh, right now. Uh, quad IO, zero. Need I say anything there? And then we've got a set of benchmarks. And um, oh, yeah, did I mention we run on the GPU? So we've got a flag which allows you to say whether or not you want to run on the GPU. And then we've got a little comparison against the regular interpreter benchmark, which is wrong. but. <laughs> 
I believe that is an incorrect. Oh, can't type on this keyboard. I asked for them to give me a nice space for my own keyboard that I like, but no. Um, yes, actually, that will work. OK, cool. So that is the defunds version in the um, interpreter. So at this point, you guys are all probably geared up, ready to be really excited about what could happen with this benchmark. And oops, this is a little warning, because what you actually have to do is understand your environment. That should do it. I did say something about modern architectures, right? I mean, if it's not above 10 gigs, it doesn't count in the, in the code defunds world, really. I mean, the, the data sets that we're targeting are, are in the like hundreds of gigabytes just for memory side of things or more. Um, terabytes of memory are not unheard of in the scale. So, so 14 gigs would be considered a micro benchmark in, in this world. Um, we're not quite up to the one terabyte yet, uh, unfortunately. So just to recall what the bench looks like. OK. Prepare to be. Very depressed. And this is, this is one of the things, when you see this, it, when you're designing a compiler, this is one of the things that makes you want to just give up on humanity, join the monastery, and head to the hills of Mount Athos. <laughs> because remember that I had some benchmarks before showing a 30% improvement over the interpreter, right? And now I have a 1,000% slowdown plus, 1.6, you know, 1,600% slowdown on the CPU for this micro benchmark. Why? I actually don't know. This occurred recently in, in the compiler. I have a regression, and I have not yet figured out why this is happening. Um, this is a very, very small benchmark, and 14.0 does very, very nicely on these scalers. So this is partly a testament to the interpreter. And I'm kind of glad that I have something to work against, as opposed to dialogue being too easy. But. Uh, <laughs> This is still depressing sometimes, right? So I said, well, the usual solution is when your constant overhead is too big. In, ac or in academia, what do we do? We just make it bigger. That's right. Make it so big until the whole system breaks, and then you can report that yours worked and the others just crashed. <laughs> A real technique. I read it in all sorts of academic papers. It must be right. So here's a, a little bigger benchmark that we run. So we have 2 to the 20 elements instead of the little, you know. Um, and then we have our Black-Scholes benchmark, which we will There we go. So we've got a, a slightly bigger Black-Scholes benchmark. We notice that there are a few interesting things about this benchmark from a compiler standpoint. Almost all this code is scalar which makes it ideal for scalar fusion, which this version of the compiler is not doing right now. So there's no scalar fusion in this version of the compiler. Scalar fusion is when you, uh, scalar function fusion is when you have two scalar functions like um, power and plus, and instead of doing one and then taking the intermediate array and then doing it with the other, you fuse those operations together and do it over all at once. So you eliminate intermediate arrays and other things like that. But we have this interesting each here with an internal function, a nested function. And that is going to be called across the whole range of this, which means that we will see a little bit of function overhead associated with this, um, this defund, which I, I hope that the dialog compiler interpreter in 14.0 might eliminate a little bit of. I don't know. Um, I haven't tested it. so. We, we've got that. But this is, the, this is the benchmark. So we go up here. Let's, let's generate some data. Let's get our code back here. Yeah. So we're going to generate some data. And then we're going to compile this and make sure that's set. Uh, yeah, we'll want that. That'll be good. 
Yep. Yep. Nope. Yep. OK. So let's run that, and let's see what we get. I already said it, so we're OK. OK, so now much more reasonable numbers. And unfortunately, I still have that performance regression. So there's a bit of an issue there, which I'm still working on. But you'll notice that the GPU code is actually giving us a little bit of a speed up, which is kind of cool. Uh, yes? Isn't the star mean the result is different? Yes, this is intentionally different. Um, there's, um, the, the input formats are slightly different on these. So. The, the star in comp x here indicates that the values were different. So that's because the shape of the incoming and outgoing arrays are different for these two functions. Would you repeat my question? GP, what is GPU? GPU. Oh, dear. I had not accounted for that. Uh, does, do we know what the GPU? Or do we have a lot of people who don't, aren't familiar with GPU execution as a general purpose? OK, a few of them. That, all right, so the GPU is what drives your graphics on the card normally, the graphics processing unit. But they happen to be very, very good at doing massively parallel vectorized tile operations. So they've become popular for doing general purpose computations. So the Tesla architecture and NVIDIA and things like that are these chips designed specifically to do general purpose computation with these graphics processing chips. And we now support that on the code funds side of things. So we can do GPU execution on the system. And this is kind of cool. Uh, at least I think this is kind of cool. Yes. Uh, two questions. Yeah. One is if you're, I'm surprised that GPU based execution of largely scalar stuff is beating the interpreter. Uh, you know, you know more, more, than the, more than the CPU based uh, ah. compiled code. Ah, okay, yeah. That, so, that's one yeah. question. And the other one is I'm surprised that you're, uh, you said that you don't do scalar. Uh, uh, Function fusion, fusion, fusion of yes. scalar, scalar oriented operations. Yeah. I would expect that the C compiler would do that for you. Just I could show you the C standard. code that's generated, and then you would see why not. Okay, but we can we can do that if you guys want to in a little bit because I want to get a little bit down and dirty with this stuff. So, yes, the the reason that the GPU is good at this is because we have a large array. So the GPU is essentially this giant vector machine for these scalar operations. So it can do all of them in parallel. More or less. Okay, when, oh, when you said scalars, I thought you meant, I thought you meant scalar operating on scalars. No, no, this is scalar you're function fusion. On, so this it is, is scalar it is, it is, class is functions operating on very large arrays. Well, kind of a large. This isn't that big. Um, this is kind of still small. Um, 2 to the 20 is pretty small. Um, so we've got this, but last night at 3 a.m., well, it was 2, it, it all got fuzzy after midnight, but I was like, wait a second, I can't just come up here with this. This is, this is terrible, this is bad. I, I've got to do something better than that. So I started looking at my benchmark code again. And this is what we do in GPU programming. Let's see if I can actually get the code itself. All right, so I said, eh, no, I can't do anything with that, but there's that each again. And so if we go, let's see if this works here. Uh, yes, OK, OK, hang on. So what we do with the GPU programming, this will give you an idea of the kind of issues that we face. Um, we're going to just pull up another terminal. And there we go. OK. Oh, shoot, wait. Now I know why it's not working. That's not a profiling script. There we go. OK, so this is the visual profiler, which will run that benchmark which you saw there and give us some analysis of the program. So. When we look at this, we can see why that is going slowly. Because we've got these three distinct phases in our computation. That corresponds to what the GPU is doing. That, in fact, corresponds to almost all of our computation. 
very little of this time is uh, the scalar computation is spent doing anything. It's very fast on the GPU. What's not so fast is this space in the middle. And those spaces happen to correspond directly to that call to each. Because the each in the naive version of this compiler will not be turned into a GPU'd kernel, which means that it has to copy the memory back out of the GPU, which has its own memory space, back onto the CPU, run the kernel using a slower method, then send it back onto the GPU each of these times and get it back working. So we're actually spending most of our time on that, that each function, if you will. And that's a problem. That's no good. So, like we do in GPU programming, we cheat. So, let's see if it's uh, da 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 da. Quads, yar. Yes. So, that's what this lower part is. We have this function. here, which is exactly the same benchmark, but this time I am simulating the compiler's ability to scalarize that each function, which if I had the analysis, it could do. I do have the analysis. It's not implemented yet, so I'm pretending that this is authentic. So where we had that each function before, now I've got this specialized compilation that would be created. So this is what the compiler should generate. This function here is doing what that each is doing, except it's using the GPU to do it. And it's running this GPU kernel, which is the um, un loop unrolled version of that, that inner defunds that we have there. So if we replace that under the system, let's see if I can get back to my benchmark. So now I'll compile that new version and go ahead and run the comparison against the interpreter with that. And assuming that the demons of benchmarking haven't attacked, let's see what we get. Ah, and voila. And so now, because of that optimization, we're able to exceed the interpreter by a reasonable amount without any scalar function fusion, actually. So scalar function fusion netted us a 30% then. The GPU execution, when it's actually fully realized w gives us between 20 and 30, depending on the runtime and how active the GPU is at the time. Will the two together give us 60? Almost certainly not. <laughs> Although I'm hoping for better than 30. Um, it'd be really sad if you, in fact, I fully expect to get some net benefit of combining fusion with the GPU because the GPU is built for fusion. So the two together really make a difference. They have not been put together yet. These have been separately prototyped in the compiler. So the good news, though, is that we have two different approaches now to improving performance on the already snippy and zippy uh, Dialog 14. And if we run NVVP on profile, let's see. We can run our profiler on this. And it, recall last time we had a bunch of space in between the execution of the GPU. Now you can see the difference in how it operates. We have almost no space there. And so the GPU is getting better utilization. Unfortunately, it's still getting terrible utilization, which is why we're only at 23. If we did some extra optimizations, we could do almost everything entirely on the GPU and max it out, uh, which we don't do right now. Up there in the runtime, you see those marks. Those are marks where we're doing excessive memory copies and things like that. Malloc's freeze, things that we shouldn't be doing. So this is, this is the life of the APLer running code on the GPU a little bit. Um, if anybody knows CUDA and can figure out why the dialog interpreter interferes with the CUDA analyzer, talk to me. <laughs> I have not yet figured out why that happens. OK, so that is your, your starting benchmark, your special sauce, the GPU execution. And what I like about this, which is for me, is I can flip GPU execution on and off with the flick of a switch. So I don't have to go through this large compile, edit, run cycle. Instead, I can be in my interpreter, interpreting code. Then I can switch to a compiled 
run, run it on the CPU. Then I can switch without doing any extra work to running it on the GPU. And in the future, the plan is to use some research we're doing at CREST, the Center for Research in Extreme, Extreme Sta Scale Technologies, to do seamless distribution on the cloud, if you will. So sending this stuff not only from the GPU, but also out to your supercluster that you've rented space on from your dialogue interpreter and making this stuff run. So that's, that's our, our target. Um, and let you use, and that's where the threading really comes in. Um, things like PAR don't really play nice on the GPU so much, but the primitives do. Then in order to really leverage PAR, you want to have lots and lots of cores that you can use. So those will be on like massively distributed machines, th machines with like maybe a, a million cores or something like that. So, okay, now. Where were we? I have a quick question. Sure. Was there any real reason for taking all the white space out of your C code? Yes. I Whitney-fied it. <laughs> <laughs> Do, yeah, OK. <laughs> no, actually, so there is a big reason. I was using white space in my C code. And the problem was it was a mental headache every time I transitioned from my APL code to my C code. And there was an actual real cognitive dissonance there when I was trying to switch back and forth. So when I looked at what I could do with the Witnified C, it, while it scares off every C programmer known to man, <laughs> it does actually make things a lot easier for me to swap back and forth because the patterns are very similar between the two codes. So there's a, I may be crazy. And tomorrow, it may all be pretty fight again. But I've got a tool for that, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> So if I need to show it to some C programmers, I can prettify it before I show it to them. Yeah, it all works out. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're a C engineer. I remember that. OK, so let's see. Where do we want to go from here? I, uh, let's, we've got 10 minutes. Let's, let's go to a brief interlude here and talk a little bit about the course of designing this compiler. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this little thing. And unfortunately, it was very true for code funds in the sense that it's taken me a lot to write 187 lines of code. <laughs> uh, it's the, the code funds compiler has gone through iteration after iteration after iteration to really get to where it is now. And the, the compactness of the compiler kind of belies how much effort has gone into that. Um, one of the really neat features of the compiler is that Branching and recursion are considered bugs. <laughs> so there is almost no branching or recursion in the core parts of the compiler. The parser, we're going to have to do a little recursion right now because I haven't solved that. Uh, but branching is, is essentially going the way of the dodo in the rest of the compiler. And we are able to do everything with these bulk parallel data flow style operations, including things like lexical scope resolution and tree traversals and other things that you would normally not expect from something without ever using recursion or branching. And if you tell any standard computer scientist that this is done, they'll look at you kind of askance and say, uh, maybe in theory I don't remember my Turing you know, machines, but, but you're crazy. It turns out to be really nice. And uh, we're working on a, uh, what I call a real solution to APL type systems. And by this, I don't mean real as in SimCore, which actually has something that runs, works, and helps them. I mean. <laughs> I mean something that has the <laughs> idealistic precision of dependent type systems with the syntactic purity of an APL programmer's uh, you know, dream. So, yeah. so we're working on that. I've got ideas for how to do it. I think uh, we will be able to have something out. This is part of the optimization of the compiler, because we need the information gained from this in order to do optimi optimizations. But we need useful information, not just C-style si types. And the compiler loves trains, index of, and rank, as well as key. It's used all over the place. They're the foundation of lexical scope resolution and other sort of things. And the trains were great until I found a non-deterministic bug, which has been fixed, thankfully. That was a, a ride. Um, so yeah. Uh, and we can trivially, trivially switch back and forth from the GPU and the CPU execution. I do want to say, I believe I got the go ahead from Gita 
on the release agreement for the compiler. So with any luck, very shortly, the compiler will be available in an academic friendly form on GitHub with an open source license that will run. You will still need dialogue in order to run the code, and obviously you won't be able to run it commercially. Uh, but at this point, the compiler is not there for commercial use yet. But you will be able to see and play with it, and I'm hoping to get more people involved with that. So I've got a couple of last words before I take questions, and we can show some more demos as well. One of the things is I really want code defunds to be a community galvanizing sort of thing, something that draws the community and shows support and gets them reaching out into other communities. So you can visit my GitHub, my website. Uh, you can drop me a little friendly monetary gift to help support the future development of code defunds. And you can send me code, which also helps, because I want code to run and play with or just do some pair programming on why things go slow. And I'm calling out SimCore for doing a community-based parser that we can all work with, written in APL. So I want to, I want to do that. Send code, sacrodeo.us or GitHub. My email address is there and so forth. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. All right. Questions, or should I just show some code? Hello? Yes. <laughs> When you're um, running on a multi-user, multi-programming operating system and using the GPU, yes. who does the task swapping on the GPU? Um, it is not unheard of for a, an ill-written CUDA program to deadlock the entire computer. So if you're serious about GPU programming in business, what you generally do is you have separate GPUs dedicated to compute units. So they're like extra processors that only do that stuff. And then you have a separate display CPU for displaying on your screen or controlling your screen so that you don't create these deadlocks. And you have single, uh, the, the CUDA drivers are actually technically in charge of the swapping, but it is C or even lower level than that. So it is possible to break it. Um, but if you want to look up some of that, you can look up the term uh, heterogeneous parallel computing and multi-device kind of computing. And there's a lot of academic research on being able to manage and control GPUs and CPUs across the cloud and, and do the, the kind of task level management of that, job management. Can you give us kind of slowly Leslie Cooper's title of her thesis Lindsay and how to get Cooper. it? How Lindsay to get Cooper. It? Yes, Lindsay Cooper. Let me see if I can write it up here. Okay. It is Lindsay Cooper, and I don't remember the exact title, but I think it's something like Lattice Based uh, Approaches to Quasi Deterministic Parallel. Uh, Concurrent programming, maybe something like that. And how to get it? Uh, you'd have to either email her or, uh, yeah, email her. That's the way to get it. Uh, that's lcooper at indiana.edu. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't want to rain on your parade, but I think when you start putting optimizations in this thing, you'll find that a lot of them have to work with other optimizations until they reach a fixed point. So yes. we're stuck yes. with recursion or looping. So looping, I allow. Recursion, I don't allow, stylistically. So I use power limit, for instance, and some of the others. Um, but I don't, I don't use the, the Dell, basically. Well, I, I do, but yeah, I avoid it. Yeah. So, yep. And you should see if you can figure out the uses of index of and rank and key in here. <laughs> no, but. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.